I was uh, leaving New York City, and as I was, I was flying out of LaGuardia Airport. Got on the airplane, and just I was flying United, and because I fly a lot, occasionally I get upgraded. Now, I don't want you to think that I fly first class all the time. I only fly first class if, it's, if they upgrade me free. The reason I fly coach is because there is no third or fourth class. At the General Conference, we try to buy the cheapest air tickets possible. So anyway, I was upgraded into first class, and I was just enjoying it. You know, I was following the biblical principle that says, I know how to abound and I know how to abase. You know, so when the Lord allows you to abound in first class, and they're bringing you orange juice and peanuts and all those nuts, you know, that those fancy kind of nuts that you don't get back in the class that I usually sit in, I mean, you just rejoice. So I was just sitting there rejoicing. and. Somebody said, do you pray for the person that sits next to you so you can witness to them? I typically don't. I typically pray the Lord will give me a little quietness so I can study my Bible. And so I had my Bible out on my chair, uh, this particular Bible. And I noticed a young guy came in, in his 20s, and he sat next to me in first class. And as we took off, he looked at me, and with this rather cynical look, he said, Is that a Bible you have? And I suppose I interpreted his comment this way. Now, sir, nobody intelligent would have a Bible next to them, and you look like you're halfway intelligent anyway. What in the world are you doing with that Bible? That's the way I interpreted what he said based on the intonation of his voice. And so he said, is that a Bible you've got over there? And I said, well, it does happen to be a Bible. And uh, why are you a religious person? I knew he wasn't by the tone of his voice. He said, religious? I'm a Jew, but I'm an atheist. Now, I, you know, maybe, maybe some of you are aware that many Jews today have drifted away from their heritage, and many Jews are cultural Jews. They're actually atheists. So he said, I'm a Jew, but I'm an atheist. And so I said to him, well, you know, my friend, I would be an atheist too, but I probably don't have as much faith as you do, so since it takes so much faith to be an atheist, and since I'm a person of reason, I could never be an atheist. We well, had never heard somebody say something like that again to him. And so he kind of looked at me really strange, I mean really strange, and as if to say, I knew this guy was bizarre before, but now I think he's even more bizarre. And I said to him, you know, there's a couple things that, there are four basic questions in life. Philosophers have, try, have tried to answer them, and uh, the world's leading thinkers have tried to answer them, and they really struggle with these questions. And the first question that the atheist struggles with is, what is the purpose of life? Is the purpose of life simply to get up in the morning, eat a jelly donut, and drink a cup of black coffee? Now, I was talking to a secular atheist. I wasn't talking to somebody that went to one of Mrs. Finley's natural lifestyle cooking schools, you'll understand. And so I um, said, you know, is the meaning of life getting up and eating a jelly donut and drinking a cup of black coffee and going to work and coming home and eating supper and watching television hoping for the weekend? And you do that year in and year out. You get up and you drink your cup of black coffee and you eat a jelly donut and you go to work and then you come home and do you, um, you um, eat supper and then watch TV. Is, does life have any more purpose than that? Does life have any more meaning than that? Is life just simply this vicious cycle of activity? And I said, you know, philosophers have struggled with that down through the centuries. What is the purpose of life? What is the meaning of life? Why do we live? Another question that they have struggled with is the whole issue of pain. If God is so good, why is the world so bad? What about the suffering in our world? What about the heartache? What about the famine in our world? You know, they've struggled with that, and, and the atheists have no good answers for it. The third question is the question of injustice. Uh, for example, I did not say this to him because the event had not yet taken place, but atheists would have a really a hard time answering the question of justice. Why is there so much injustice in the world? I did point that out to him. But you take what happened in DC in the Navy Yard. A person walks in with a shotgun, sawn off shotgun, and starts shooting. Some people are dead and some people are not dead. How do you choose? How, why is there so much injustice in our world? Why is there so much unrighteousness in our world? You know, why is there so much unfairness in our world? A child is born in Africa of HIV. Uh, parents and uh, the child gets HIV. A child is born in a suburb out here in some wealthy home and um, 
the, the father leaves the mother and, uh, and the father becomes an alcoholic and he comes back and beats the mother and beats the kids. I mean, that's, that's just not right. It's, it's unjust. How do you deal with injustice? If you're an atheist, uh, wh wh how do you deal with the whole issue of injustice? And lastly, how do you deal with the problem of death? You know, uh, is death a dark hole in the ground? Is it a long night without a morning? You just die and go into the grave and worms eat your body and that's it? I mean, how do you deal with purpose in life? How do you deal with the problem of suffering? How do you deal with the problem of justice? How do you deal with the problem of death? And as I talked to that young man, I could see that lights were going on in his brain because he did not have any answers as an atheist to the problems of, of, of purpose, the problem of pain, the problem of injustice, and the problem of death. The marvelous thing for Bible-believing Christians is that we see the same thing others see, but we interpret them differently. The passage that we read this morning in our scripture reading in Titus chapter 2 that talks about the blessed hope is the ultimate answer to purpose, pain, injustice, and death. And I'm going to take, I'd like you to take your Bibles and we're going to turn to the book of Revelation and look at the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation chapter 21. Revelation, the 21st chapter. And we're going to look at four verses in Revelation chapter 21 that answer the great questions of life. The question of why do we live? The question of purpose. The question of pain and suffering. The question of injustice and the question of death. And as we study Revelation chapter 21, we'll find hope and courage for our own hearts and find an understanding of the deepest questions of life. We begin with Revelation chapter 21, and we look there at Revelation chapter 21, beginning with verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. John says, this is reality. This is not myth. This is not fantasy. This is not make-believe. This is not pipe dream. John says, exiled on the island of Patmos, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. One of the favorite places that I visit in the world and have taken tour groups is on the island of Patmos. You can go to Patmos really two ways. You can travel from Kusadashi, which is on the coast of Turkey. And if you travel off Turkey, you go out for about Oh, it takes you about three hours by boat if the sea is calm. I remember I was coming back one day and I was on a boat coming back. I had a small film crew that we were filming with out on Patmos and uh, the sea really got rough. And I was just thanking God. Thank you, God, the sea is rough. I love the sea. I was brought up on the sea as a boy. My dad and I went out on boats off southern Connecticut, Long Island Sound. Well, our crew was down in the hold of the boat. The boat was going up and down, and I was sitting up on the, on the deck, and the waves were hitting the side of the boat. They were hitting the side of the boat so bad that um, water was running through the top of the boat by about three or four inches. I mean, it was, the waves were coming over and the wind was blowing and our crew was down holding their stomachs doing that which you don't want to see a grown man do. You know, they were heaving and heaving. But I was just loving it. I mean, I love the sea. And so here John says there was no more sea. He's on the island of Patmos. He is imprisoned there looking out over the miles of sea longing to be back at Ephesus, where was John's home at this time, was Ephesus. He, Ephesus, he was a pastor, he was an old man, he was a pastor at Ephesus after he had been one of the disciples. And um, by this time, John was longing for home, longing for the day that there'd be no more separation. He was longing for family and friends. And so we, in this world, long for the new heavens and the earth. We long for no more separation from family and friends. We long to be together forever. And then John says in verse 2 and 3, that I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself shall be with them and be their God. Now, I'd like you to think about this. Notice what the scripture says. 
It says, The holy city, New Jerusalem, verse 2, comes down out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. John hears a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God. The tabernacle of God is the dwelling place of God. In the ancient sanctuary, you had the outer court where lambs were sacrificed and where the Israelites came to bring that sacrifice. Then you had the holy place of the sanctuary. But then there was the most holy place where the Shekinah glory, the presence of God, was manifest. So here, John says, I saw the tabernacle of God, the dwelling place of God. I saw the New Jerusalem descending out of heaven to earth. And I heard a loud voice saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Here is a divine announcement. Here is an announcement before the whole universe. An announcement before cherubims and seraphims. An announcement before all the unfallen worlds. God is moving. God is moving. From the tabernacle of the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary, God guides the destinies of the universe. The tabernacle of God is the cosmic control center of the universe. If you think of our planet, we have our Earth, we have planets revolving with Earth around the Sun. And all of these planets, like great ballerinas, dancing through the heavens, travel at thousands and tens of thousands of miles an hour. Who keeps these planets from colliding one with the other? God does. Who says to the tides, come here and go no further? God does. Who guides the sunset and the sunrise and sunset? God does. Who brings the seasons forth? God does. So from the cosmic control center of the universe, God keeps all the planets in their orbits not to collide. From the cosmic control center of the universe, God says to the tides, you come here and go no further. God says the sun rises and it rises. But God not only guides our solar system, but there are thousands and tens of thousands and millions and billions of stars and planets. And so God guides the destiny of all of the nations. God causes rulers to rise and rulers to fall. So that's all done from God's command center. But here is a solemn announcement. I don't want you to miss the impact of this. Don't want you to miss the significance of this. Here, after the second coming of Christ, after the millennium, there's an angel that steps forth, raises his hand to heaven, and the angel shouts, I, John says, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God is going to move. Have you ever moved from one place to another? Have you ever moved your house and you have filled out a little card for the post office that says you have moved? Well, this is the divine announcement that God is going to move. God is going to take this planet in rebellion. He's going to take this planet defiled by sin. He's going to take this planet. He's going to remake it over into Edenic splendor. The holy city is actually going to come down. God is going to move. And this planet in rebellion, this planet so pockmarked by sin and defilement, is going to become the capital of the universe. And you and I are going to be sons and daughters with God, princes and princesses with God, ambassadors for Christ, traveling from planet to planet, from world to world, to star to star, to tell the story of His goodness, the story of His grace. What is the purpose of life? The purpose of life is to live with God, to see God, and dwell with Him forever. And so here, in Revelation chapter 21, the Scripture says to us, that the tabernacle of God is with men. Notice the intimacy of these words. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself shall be with them and be their God. In the Garden of Eden, God walked and talked with Adam and Eve. In the Garden of Eden, they saw his face before sin. Look at Revelation chapter 22. Notice what scripture says. Revelation 22 verse 3. There shall be no more curse. Revelation 22, verse 3. But the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. Verse 4. They shall see His face, and His name shall be upon their forehead. They shall see His face. 
You and I have a God-shaped vacuum in our hearts for God. You cannot deny it. There is eternity in every single heart. There's a longing for eternity. There's a longing in every heart to say life must be more than simply getting up and eating food and making money and having a house and living and dying. There's something in every heart that longs for eternity. There's something in every heart that longs for God. We were made for God. You can deny it. You can make believe it doesn't exist, but we were made for God. One of the things that deeply impressed me with that thought was during the days of communism, my wife and I were living in England. And uh, I was responsible for pastoral development in three of the communist countries, Poland, Hungary, Yugoslavia. And we often traveled there. Often I spent time negotiating with communist governments trying for religious freedom. And because we were able to have a measure of success in those countries, when communism fell, we were given the opportunity immediately to go into the former Soviet Union. And we had a series of meetings in the Kremlin. When we had meetings in the Kremlin, auditorium, and the Kremlin was like the citadel of communism. And Gorbachev spoke there, Chinenko spoke there, uh, Khrushchev spoke there, all the great communist leaders. Not only were we in the Kremlin, but we were in the Congress Palace of the Kremlin, which was really dedicated to the Communist Party. It's where the Communist Party had all of their meetings. The Communist government had fallen, and we were allowed to use the Congress of Communism for our meetings. When we began to advertise, within days, 6,500 people had registered for those meetings received a telegraph here in the United States. So at that day, we weren't using emails so much then, but received a message from, from the, uh, our Adventist officials in Russia, and they said to me, Pastor Mark, we filled the auditorium with 6,500. There's another 6,500 that we can fill. I said, let's do it. When I went to preach, stood on the platform where Chenenko stood and where Andropov stood and where all these communist leaders stood, and open the Bible. The Russian general who had led the Afghan invasion, that terrible war that took place for 11 years where the Russians bombed and destroyed large parts of Afghanistan. At the end of the meeting, the Russian leader came up to me, rank atheist previously, and he, he was a Russian general, and he, he threw his arms around me, gave me a Russian bear hug, and he looked me in the eye this close, and he said, Pastor, Dr. Finley, after your lecture tonight, a group of Russian intellectuals and philosophers met together. And we said to ourselves, atheism has no future for our country. Because there is something inside of us. You can deny it for decades, but there is something inside of us that longs for God. What's the purpose of life? The purpose of life is to know God. The purpose of life is to have that God-shaped vacuum in your heart fulfilled. The purpose of life is to have an intimate relationship with the living Christ. Money does not satisfy. Cars don't satisfy. Clothes don't satisfy. Indulgence in food doesn't satisfy. There's only one thing that satisfies that longing. And that's knowing God. But no matter how close we know him now, no matter how intimate our relationship with his, him is now, there's always that longing in life. Something is missing. Have you ever felt that way in your life? I feel that way in my life. There's something missing. I long for something more than I have. God has put that longing in your heart. God has put that longing in my heart. And that longing will only be completely fulfilled when we see him face to face. That's why Revelation chapter 21 says, I, John, you can almost feel the pathos in his voice. You can almost hear the excitement in his voice. I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. John says, I saw it. It's as exciting, as festive, as celebrative as a wedding. 
Verse 3, he says, I heard this loud voice, the tabernacle of God is with men. And you can almost feel the excitement. God's going to dwell with us. We will be his people. We're not going to be lonely anymore. We're not going to be foreigners in the land. We're not going to be pilgrims in the land. We are going to be with Christ forever. What do you say? Amen. And then he says, and God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor cry. There will be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. John says, in this life there will be pain. We're in a battle between good and evil. We're in a battle between Christ and Satan. In this life there will be car accidents, and Christians will be killed, their lives will be snuffed out. In this life, Christians will get cancer. In this life, at times, we will lose our jobs. In this life, there'll be pain, there'll be suffering. But there is a blessed hope. Jesus Christ is going to come. And the coming of Jesus buoys up our spirits. The coming of Jesus causes us to long for that day when every tear will be wiped away, where every sorrow will be gone, where there will be no more pain. I was in Hungary the night that the Berlin Wall fell. And as a result of that, hundreds of thousands of people marched in the streets. I was lecturing. When the Berlin Wall fell, the universities opened up in Hungary. And so I was invited to go to university after university to speak to young people about the truthfulness of the Bible and about God and faith. And we often had question and answer periods after that time. I spoke a hundred times in 30 days a hundred times in 30 days, often in universities to university students, and had many amazing experiences. One day I went to a place called Shekhazvara. Shekhazvara is an interesting place. It was the citadel of communism. It was really in the country, the place where the communist intellectuals were, and was lecturing there. Um, and I remember raising a question with the students. And this is the question I raised to them. I said, okay, let's suppose you don't believe. Let's suppose you're an atheist. Let's suppose you say there is no God. I said, that, that, from an intellectual standpoint, I will give you that one. Let's, let's just say that. Although I believe there's incredible evidence for God, although I believe that the evidence is overwhelming and the evidence for faith is far greater than the evidence for atheism. But I said, I, for purpose of discussion, let's say that you're an atheist. I have a question for you. Your best friend has just gotten in a car accident. A drunk driver has just hit your best friend. Your best friend's wife was killed in the car accident. Your best friend's two children were killed in the car accident. And your best friend is going to be a quadriplegic for the rest of his life. Now the thing that I want to know from you is you go to the hospital to visit him. I want to know what you're going to say. What are you going to say? Too bad you're going to be a quadriplegic the rest of your life. And too bad you'll never see your wife again and she's dead, she's in the grave, there's nothing after that. And I'll give you some hope, worms will eat her body and you know that's, that's about the only hope I can give you. And I'm sorry about your two kids, I mean they're dead too. And you know, uh, you know, that kind of happens to people in life and you know just kind of get over it and move on. Okay, Mr. Atheist, tell me, share with me the hope you're going to give me. What is that hope? You see, as a Christian, I can go in there and put my arms around that person and weep with them and say, you know, we're in a terrible, terrible world. There is good and evil. And I can't explain everything that happened to your wife and your kids. It's beyond my explanation, but I know this. One day Jesus is going to come. And one day there will be no pain. One day there will be no suffering. One day there will be no heartache. I know two things. First that this is tough what you're going through, but Christ is going to comfort you. Christ is going to be there by your side to give you encouragement. Christ is here to put his arms around you. He will get you through this. But you can look beyond the tears because Revelation 21 verse 4 says, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. I thank God that there is an answer to the problem of pain. 
There's an answer to the problem of suffering. There's an answer to the problem of sickness. Science, with all of its technologi technological genius, has not solved the problem of sickness. It has not solved the problem of pain. It has not solved the problem of suffering. Visit any hospital. And the human race has worked for thousands of years, and we've never solved that problem. But thank God, there is a Jesus who is coming again. And the problem of pain will one day be over. Jesus Christ will come. The problem of sorrow will one day be over. The problem of tears will one day be over. We have a hope and we have a message to share with a world that is hurt and bruised and bleeding. A message that gives people hope today and joy for tomorrow. The Bible goes on. What about that problem of justice? I've had people say to me, well, life is fair. People get what they deserve. Anybody who says that just doesn't know life. Because often people get what they do not deserve. They get what they do not deserve. Certainly, some of the choices we make lead to certain results. Certainly, our choice does make a difference. But there are people in this world who have not made negative choices, but suffer terribly. All you need to do is come with me to India and see little children that are starving, not by their own choice, but by the selfish choices of others. All you need to do is come with me to, to Africa and see children, many of them suffering with HIV, not because of their choices at all. Often poverty, those who are the most downtrodden, it's not because of their choice. It's because of a world that we live in. Injustice. The world has little answer to injustice. The world has little answer to the problem of why did this happen to one person and not happen to another person. What's the Bible teaching about injustice? The Bible teaching is that the world is unjust and unjust, but God is just. And that in spite of all of the injustices of this world, God is still working in the life of those people that are treated so downtroddenly. He can warm them with his grace. And obviously as a church, we are to reach out to the poor and the downtrodden and reach out to those who we can minister to in any way possible. I was so impressed just yesterday hearing an interesting news report. You may have heard it. A blind woman went into a Dairy Queen to buy an ice cream. And as she went in, she was taking out her wallet and she took out a $20 bill and it fell on the floor. Now she's blind, so she didn't quite know where it was. So she was kind of looking around and she walked over here and the $20 bill was there. Somebody walked over and picked up the $20 bill and quickly made their way out of the store. The blind woman was there. She had no money. That's all she had in her wallet. The young cashier, seeing her holding the ice cream in her hand and seeing the person go out the door, couldn't do anything to get the person who went out the door. So the young cashier took out his wallet, took out $20 and put it in her hand and said, I've got your 20 here it is. I've got 20 for you. He didn't lie to me. He said, I've got $20 for you. Here it is. Here is a person who saw injustice, did not stand by, but said, ma'am, here's $20 for you. God calls his church in a world of injustice to be the voice of the downtrodden, the voice of the poor the voice of the hurt, the voice of the marginalized. But there will be a time when all injustice will be gone. What's the ultimate answer to the problem of injustice? Daniel chapter 7. One day the king of righteousness will come. One day righteousness will reign. Daniel chapter 7. 
This world may be unjust, but God is just. This world may be unfair, but God is fair. This world may leave us in a situation where we are oppressed at times. Is it fair for a businessman to run off with his secretary and leave his wife of 30 years with bills and, 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 and have her... Is that, is that fair? No. Is it fair for a man to go out and get drunk and come home and beat his wife? No. Is it fair for a drunk driver to hit a car and, uh, and someone be killed innocently? No. Was it fair in Newtown, Connecticut for a young man to walk into a school and start shooting and shoot those children? Was that fair? No. Was it just what happened in Washington this last week? No. This is gross injustice. We see it in our world. But the scripture says, Daniel 7 verse 26, But the court shall be seated. One day righteousness will reign. One day the righteous judge will sit upon his throne and turn everything that has been unjust and unjust to be just. One day he will turn unrighteousness to be righteousness. In the proportion that we have suffered, the proportion we will sit next to Jesus on his throne. That's incredible good news, isn't it? Amen. It is incredible good news. But the court shall be seated. They shall take away his dominion. What's the dominion that will be taken away? The dominion of evil. The dominion of wickedness. The dominion of injustice. To consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. You and I are people of destiny. You and I are people, princes and princesses, to receive the kingdom of God and to reign with Him forever and ever and ever and ever. Every wrong will be righted. Every injustice will be turned around. So rather than be bitter that I've been treated unjustly, rather than be angry that I've been treated unjustly, rather than be filled with with rancor because I've been treated unjustly. I look beyond the injustice, beyond the unfairness, beyond the treatment. And I say, one day Jesus will make all things right. And one day you and I will reign with him forever. And we can put up with a little bit of injustice and unfairness today. Because for millions and trillions of years, we will live with Jesus through the ceaseless ages of eternity who will make all things right. Notice verse 27. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and their dominion shall serve and obey him forever. This kingdom of this world is not an everlasting kingdom. It is a temporary kingdom. The great questions of life, the question of purpose to know God, the question of pain, when Jesus comes, it's going to be gone forever. The question of injustice, we serve a God that is just. And I may be treated unjustly, but he one day will make all things right. And the last of that quartet of questions, what about death? Take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 21. Death is something that you never get out of your mind. All of us from time to time, some of us more than others, think about death. For some, death becomes incredibly fearful. The older you get, the closer you recognize that you're getting nearer to that day. And here the Bible says in Revelation chapter 21, Revelation chapter 21, and the Bible puts it this way in Revelation chapter 21, looking at verse 4, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death. There shall be no more death. No more funeral trains, no more caskets, no more cemeteries, no more headstones, no more eulogies. There shall be no more death. The dominion of evil will be destroyed. The kingdom of hell will be vanquished. The empire of the evil one will be crushed. Only the giver of life can give life. 
Only the Creator can recreate. Only the Immortal One can give immortality. Only the Resurrected One will be resur can give resurrection. Here is incredible good news. You and I can look beyond disease, beyond disaster, beyond death, to the glorious day of the coming of Jesus. Not long ago, I attended a funeral that really moved me, and I need to give you a little background why I was so moved by it. Some of you know that, that a few months back, I went through quite a health challenge, and a, really a major health stick scare. Thank God I'm doing so much better. But the original diagnosis that I had was multiple myeloma. And multiple myeloma is an environmental disease that has nothing to do with your lifestyle. My wife and I exercise regularly. We are vegan, plant-based vegetarians, and so we've tried to do everything we know to maintain our health. I've spent a lot of time in Eastern Europe, and one of the things that research is indicating today is that, that one of the causes of multiple myeloma may be a, a lot of metal in your system. And I was in Eastern Europe and Russia right after the Chernobyl disaster, and we don't know what happened then. And they don't have as many standards in Eastern Europe as, the, um, as we do in America with the pollutants in the waterways. And so, you know, you drink the water, you eat the food, you just don't know what's happening in your body. And so anyway, the original diagnosis after I had broken a couple of ribs, as I shared with you earlier, was multiple myeloma. They've scaled that back now to a pre-myeloma, which is called mugus. And so I just have to be careful, but I'm doing really well. And I, I just praise God for your prayers and so forth. But anyway, at the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, where I work, I have a real dear friend who is the head of our publishing work. His name is Howard Figo. About six or seven years ago, his wife Anna got multiple myeloma, and she waged this tremendous battle, and she died. So I went to the funeral, and um, I was there at the funeral, and I knew at that point that I had been, they thought I was diagnosed with multiple myeloma. So I, you know, you're sitting at the funeral, and they went through what happened in her background and this valiant struggle, valiant struggle that she had and all the kinds of treatments that she had, you know, and, and I'm sitting there, you know, picturing in my mind these varying treatments and, and going through this funeral and I'm praying to the Lord, Lord, give me strength and give me courage and give me hope. As Anna struggled with multiple myeloma, she knew about two years before her death that she was going to die. And she decided to look beyond death and not allow death to conquer her, but that she would conquer it. She, allowed, she decided, she made a conscious decision in her mind that cancer was not going to destroy her spirit, that she was going to conquer and be victorious. And this is what she decided to do. She said, what I'm going to do is start to read my Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and I will underline key passages in the Bible that apply especially to my daughter. She has a daughter that's about 21, 22, in her 20s. And so she began to read the Bible and mark it with passages and write little notes in the margin for her daughter. She completed that project in about six months, called her daughter by her bedside and said, Honey, the most precious gift I can give you is my Bible that's all marked with notes in it. She gave it to her daughter. Then she started reading a second Bible from Genesis to Revelation, marking special passages for her son and writing notes. She did that and gave it to her son. She marked a third Bible that she gave. Then she took Desire of Ages and began to read Desire of Ages during the last nine months of her life on the life of Christ. And she would take Desire of Ages, underline it, write notes in it, and when her friends came to visit her, she would have completed a Desire of Ages and give it to her best friends. How can you have such faith? How can you have such courage? How can you have such hope when you're dying? Why don't you lash out in bitterness and say, this should never have happened to me? Why can you have such hope? Titus chapter 2, the scripture reading. Here is why we as Christians can be filled with hope. Titus the second chapter. Titus the second chapter. Here is why we can be filled with such great hope. Titus chapter 2. You're looking there at... Titus 2, verse 13, looking for, 
looking for, looking for, anticipating, expecting, hoping. Titus 2 verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Why can we have such hope? Because we know that one day every desire will be fulfilled. We know that one day every disease will be healed. We know that one day every war will cease. We know that one day every pain will be subdued. We know that one day every tear will be dried. One day every heart will be healed. One day every relationship will be mended. One day every tragedy will be over. One day every disaster will be gone. We are looking for the blessed hope. So we can leave this church today with purpose, knowing that pain will be over, knowing injustice will be righted, knowing that Jesus will be come and death will be gone forever. We can leave this church today filled with hope because of the blessed hope. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we just thank you today with all of our hearts that one day we can see Jesus. And we long to see you, Father. We long to see Jesus. We long for that holy city to descend. We long to be in that city when it descends. We long for the earth to be made new. We long for pain to be over. For every tear to be wiped away. For suffering to be gone. We long for every wrong to be righted. And for justice to reign forever. And we long for death to be a thing of the past. Grant us faithfulness. Help us to be faithful to Jesus. Help us live with him forever. And help us leave this place filled with hope and courage to share with a world that desperately needs to have answers to the question of purpose and pain and injustice and death. May we be ambassadors for you today in Christ's name. Amen.